The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Warren King, and I want to welcome you to the Upper Midwest uh, Grazing Educators webinar series. Uh, this is the second of the uh, presentations that we've conducted in the webinar series. Uh, Green Bland's uh, Blue Waters uh, is our sponsor this morning, along with the Pasture Project of the Wallace Center. We're going to present this morning on uh, grass-based farm financials. So again, uh, welcome. So my name again is Warren King, and my partner in crime here is uh, James Jewett, a research fellow at the University of Minnesota and from the Greenlands Blue Waters uh, group. Uh, now we're going to do a technical orientation. Uh, so Robert, why don't you take it away? Hi, everybody. Our software is fairly straightforward. Uh, we have the presentation there on the left, and then on the right you have your control panel. Uh, sometimes the software automatically collapses the control panel. The control panel should be way over there on the right. Uh, and if it's collapsed and you want to open it up, you can click on that orange button, and it will expand. Uh, to make sure that this stops happening, you can click on the View button up there, and you can deselect auto-hide the control panel, and it will stay... Uh, it will stay expanded. We have two ways that you'll be able to interact with us today. Uh, you can either type your question into the control panel there or you can uh, raise your hand. Uh, and how to do that is uh, hanging off on the left side of your control panel. There's a button right there uh, and you can raise your hand. Uh, if you have a question, uh, you can raise your hand and then we will unmute you and then you'll be able to speak to us. Uh, either way, typing the question in or raising your hand works perfectly fine for us and we encourage you to ask questions throughout the session. Uh, fi finally, we have a post-webinar survey. Uh, one of the ways that it'll get to you is it'll pop right up after you exit the webinar uh, and we'll also email you a copy as well. We ask that you please uh, fill out the survey for us. It, it makes for a, for a, for a better experience and, and helps with uh, continuous improvement. I think that's it for me, and I will hand things back over to Warren. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, and, as, uh, and as was said, uh, we would I, uh, excuse me, like you to uh, certainly take the survey at the end. Uh, your questions are welcome uh, throughout the presentations. So there's no need to uh, save your questions till the end. We've got several monitors who are uh, viewing both the chat box and the raised hands, and we'll call on you in order. So again, who's uh, sponsoring the sustainable webinar? This webinar series, uh, Greenlands, Blue Waters, and the Pasture Project. Uh, some of our goals uh, for Greenlands, Blue Waters, to increase the perennial forage and pasture. Uh, improve environmental performance of farming and maintain production and productivity. Uh, we're very much aligned in the pasture project. We'd love to see the expansion of grass-based uh, livestock production in the upper Midwest. Uh, we're working to accelerate the transition uh, in sustainable farming and improve water quality. So why are we having a, a focus on grazing educators? Uh, you can you can see all the different bullet points there. Uh, I think what's important uh, to me, uh, one of the things that are important, that more landowners and, and conservationists are interested in the benefit of livestock. So we're talking to other than livestock producers, uh, a lot of us who are grazing educators, uh, and typic and also there's more young farmers that are interested in livestock production. So we uh, we hope that there's. Uh, you get some benefit out of these webinars that you find them interesting and worthwhile and that you keep coming back. There are a couple different things that a grazing uh, educator network could achieve if, we, if one were to be developed. Um, it 
could uh, build a collaboration that's more grassroots than grass tops, certainly, uh, create a platform to house tools and access materials, and uh, get us all uh, kind of engaging in what are the basic principles of grazing, and as educators, what we should be teaching to, to everyone. So again, the format of today's webinar, uh, we're going to have two presenters, uh, which will be introduced here shortly. Uh, they're going to be sharing topics and insights about the, su about the subject uh, grass-based grazing fundamentals. Again, we uh, encourage you to participate. Uh, our moderators will direct traffic. And again, the audience, uh, please take the brief survey at the end of the webinars. So our first presenter is uh, Larry Trannell. Uh, Larry received his BS and MS from UW Platteville in Ag Economics, and for the past 10 years uh, has been, a, excuse me, spent 10 years uh, as a dairy farm management agent in Iowa County. For the past 15 years, he's been a dairy field specialist with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. Uh, Larry specializes in financial analysis of all types of dairies. Um, and his recent work includes the Millionaire Model for Dairy Farms and the Organic Dairy Farm Financial Anal Analysis and, and that comparison. So Larry, welcome to the webinar series. So what I'm going to do, I'll go through on this, but whether uh, poultry line, um, so as you take a look at group. So we take a look at uh, the dairy finance, uh, so to speak. I kind of want to start with a study that was done with the Center for Dairy Profitability that was done um, in basically taking a look at years 2011, 2012, and 2013. And that study is trying to compare conventional dairying versus grazing dairying, and then also trying to compare organic dairying as well. So the lines up on top for the conventional, for grazing, I'm going to compare the conventional versus the grazing, the organic dairying, and then compare the grazing versus organic. Um, and this is for these uh, years that we take a look at. So if you take a look at a three-year average, conventional milk price is at 1995, grazing 2069, and organic at 2901. You can definitely see there's a, 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 a big difference in milk prices, especially between the organic and the grazing or the conventional. So as we move down here, um, how does that translate? Uh, the three-year average of milk per cow. So our conventional producer is producing about 23,500 pounds of milk per cow per year. The grazer is at only 15,366. So they're losing about 35% of their production, which plays and weighs heavily in the uh, economics portion of it. And then furthermore, the organic farms in the study still lost another 10% on top of that of milk production. So which of these farms is most profitable? If you're looking at production per cow, you're definitely going to say the conventional one's the most profitable. So as we move down here, net farm income in 2011, 12, and 13, over a three-year average, our conventional producers had a net farm income of about $624. The grazers at $672. So the grazers, as you compare them, had 8% more net farm income um, compared to the conventional ones. So now let's put the organics on top of that and you see a lot of studies in the Northeast where uh, the organic isn't uh, more profitable than just uh, plain grazing. We find, tend to find that a little bit different here in the Midwest. So the organics actually have a 28% increase over the, uh, or the over the grazers on net farm income. So I want to start with this piece because I want to ask the question to us as educators, what does this tell you? Okay, so most people would take a look at financial data like this and say, well, it's obvious that the organics are more profitable than the grazers, and the grazers are more profitable than the conventional ones. Okay, so case in point, the first thing I want to say is this stuff tells us absolutely nothing about the profitability comparison of these three systems. So first of all, when we take a look at, we need to make sure that this data, this three-year average, I ask the question here, is this inventory adjusted? 
which is a very important part of the, uh, the total picture to the point where if I take a look at some of the grazing financial data that I've done over the last 15, 20 years, it tends to show me that about anywhere from 15 to 25 percent of the net farm income on these grazing farms actually comes from this adjusted inventory, which tends to be a growth in cattle inventory over time. Okay, so Larry, that, yes? there's, a, there's a question of whether that net farm income figure is per cow. It is per cow. Appreciate the question. Yes, so that net farm income question, yeah, because those questions aren't showing up on mine for some reason. So that is a net farm income per cow. Okay, so then we take a look at on a per cow basis, is it inventory adjusted? So there should be um, a thought process. Does it include, um, let's say, for example, I could have a lot more feed in on inventory at the end of the year that I didn't have at the beginning of the year, or I could have a lot less. It doesn't show up on a cash basis. So we need to make sure it's inventory adjusted. And then the second thing that happens in this is also the return to labor. So we look at a lot of these conventional farms where they may have a lot of labor, but it's hired and it's already paid in these cash expenses versus somebody that's an owner operator that doesn't have any labor that's paid and all his labor is unpaid labor on at the end of the um, um, at the end of the, the financial analysis. So we just have a case in point here. I think this serves as a pretty good example that again, if you're just going to look at net farm income, whether it be per cow per farm, really doesn't tell us anything about the profitability. So I really don't know which of these uh, systems is, is most profitable based on this information. I need to, need to dig a little deeper. So that's the first um, area where a lot of people try to cross compare what uh, the economics of uh, dairy grazing are all about. So that's kind of the, just kind of an introduction. Now I'm going to uh, move up a tad little bit on this spreadsheet. And as we take a look at the second way that people try to do it is they try to do it on income over feed costs, which is the IOFC that we see. So I have a calculator here. I want to try to compare this organic or it could be a grazing type herd. I can put in their ration here in the yellow column of how many pounds of uh, feed are being fed per cow. I can put my prices in here so you can see the prices are quite high. But again, this is uh, for organic uh, type feed. And so we take a look at dollars per cow per day at 8.47, so um, feed costs on organic herd definitely pretty high. Feed costs on a grazing convention or a grazing herd that is not organic, not so high. And so the second way people try to compare this is take a look at my feed cost per cow per day, which I again say is not a very good way uh, to do it because we know our grazers tend to have low feed costs per cow per day but they tend to have pretty high feed costs on a per hundred weight of milk produced because of the lower milk production, which tends to be a, a little bit more of a fair way to try to cross compare. So this is my organic herd, herd B. Uh, I've got a conventional herd in this calculator um, for herd A. And so if I take a look at trying to compare these rations to try to get at that, let's just compare income over feed costs. I come up with this comparison that hopefully you can see on the screen here. So my herd A here is on the left. My herd B is on the right. Uh, the yellow cells that you see are basically I can take a look at. I'm going to get 75 pounds of milk out of this conventional uh, cow. So this could be a grazing cow as well. Um, here I've got a 45 pounds and an organic grazing herd. These are the components that I have on herd B. Here are my components on herd A. If I go to the far right, I have my prices that I'm going to get for my milk on the conventional herd here and my organic herd here. So you can see that the total cost per hundredweight of milk are actually almost double on the organic versus the conventional side. And that's actually pretty current for what 2015 is showing us. So then we can come down and take a look at trying to put dollar values on. Uh, so we have this thing called energy corrected milk or we have dollar corrected milk. And so I like to try to take a look at my income over feed costs on a per cow basis is actually higher on herd A than it is with um, herd B at seven, uh, the feed costs per cow. So they're definitely higher in the conventional herd than they are in the, uh, the organic grazing type herd. So on a per hundredweight basis, I've got $10.37 of income over feed cost per hundredweight versus 14 on the um, organic side. So when we take this all down, if we just go down here, I've got 80 cows in the herd on both sides here. And so if I take a look at income over feed costs per day, 
and per year here. So now we've got on a full year's basis, I've got income with fee cost of 234,000 versus 207,000 uh, with that. And so it's just a, kind of a way that we can we can try to start uh, take a look at some of the uh, comparisons on the grazing versus the uh, conventional economic kind of a, a tool that's still kind of in the draft mode, but as educators, it's it's a tool that I've started to use actually quite a bit on various herds, and I know we've got some people that, um, some of the regional managers that run organic pools that are really using the spreadsheet to kind of uh, assist their producers to really think about these income over feed costs and trying to compare um, conventional grazing versus organic grazing with that as well. So any questions on that before I move on? Uh, yeah, Larry, uh, we have a question from Carolyn Van Schack, yeah. and I have, uh, Carolyn, I've, I've uh, unmuted you if you'd like to ask that question yourself. Oh, um, yes, good morning. I was wondering, back when you were just talking about the net farm income for cow and comparing grazing versus organic, etc., is that more typically where ba bankers stop when they look at numbers? I'm not a banker, can you tell? I just was wondering, you know, you're looking at profitability uh, in a different way, and I want to know where bankers go. Okay, and I appreciate you asking that question because um, if I tend to say that there's a lot of bankers that um, when you take a look at a profit analysis of a true profit analysis, it's not something that's usually in the banker's repertoire. Um, so bankers will tend to look at cash flow, so the ability of this uh, borrower to actually pay back that money. And so um, when you take a look at cash flow, it's a very misleading uh, thing on profitability because there's non-farm income that can go into that. Your principal payment can go into that. So principal payment, I'll talk about that a little bit later. In no way, shape, or form is that an expense of your business. That's an investment that, yeah, the banker makes you uh, uh, put into the, the farm, but uh, we can't look at that as being an expense. Um, your income tax is paid. Um, the differences between capital purchases and sales during the year. So they're very um, attuned to what cash flow is to make sure that those bills can get paid. But again, cash flow and profitability do not correlate very well at all. Uh, the second thing the banker is going to take a look at is equity. And so I just had conversations here these last couple of days with several bankers about, you know, what's a, a proper debt per cow. So I know that's something that they take a look at. I really try to encourage them not to look at that because uh, depending on how much land is owned versus land rented or versus purchase feed, that number really doesn't tell us much of anything. So when you take a look at a banker, they're thinking cash flow and they need to be thinking of equity. And so when you start taking a look at the per drop in prices of assets, especially land, um, especially in these days that we're uh, experiencing here now with land prices, okay, they need to protect their equity. Uh, so those are the two things that the banker would take a look at. Um, they may work with some income over feed costs uh, per cow if they look at that as being a problem on the herd, um, but typically it's a cash flow equity issue. Any other questions? Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to real quickly, just because um, when I take a look at my extension career, I would tend to say that a lot of my success has come by trying to get producers to actually do a financial analysis. Okay, so once I get the producers to be able to do a financial analysis, we start taking a look at strengths and weaknesses in the business, and that's when I can get onto the farm and start taking a look at your labor inefficiency is just something that just kind of continually brings itself here. Let's look at the facilities. Let's do a facility assessment and see where those issues of labor inefficiency are. And in the same way, you take a look at um, production type issues that show up in a financial analysis that's, been, that's well benchmarked. And then we can start saying, well, where are those production issues? Is it cow comfort? Is it dry matter intake, either out in the pasture or in the feed bunk, and some of those things. And so it, it gets producers to ask a lot of uh, questions about their operation. So what I'm going to do is uh, to take a look at this financial analysis. I'm just going to move the cursor here to the right. So basically, to do a financial analysis, on January 1st, if that's their tax year, every year we need to train these producers to take a balance sheet so they're going to take a picture of their farm on January 1st of each year. And so they have both a beginning and an ending, where they started, where they ended. And in that picture, it's going to show the number of cows. It's going to put a value on those cows. It's going to show the number of uh, 
tons of feed of different uh, types. We're going to put a value on those. Uh, it's going to show the assets in the way of the buildings and the land and things like that. So we have that picture at the beginning of the year. We're also going to take that picture at the end of the year, and we're going to be able to inventory adjust this farm so that you know, they know the ending minus the beginning. Did they gain in feed? Did they lose in feed? Did they gain in cows? Did they lose in cows? Those inventory adjustments, like I said, a lot of times that's 15 to 25 percent of their income over the year. And if we don't adjust for that, just because it doesn't get cashed out, sometimes it's hard to adjust. So it's a very important uh, part of it. So at the beginning of the year we have here, at the end of the year we have here. So where the blue um, cells are in the white background, the blue fonts here, basically I'm putting my values of corn, say here 7,000 bushels at the end of the year, we had um, 9,000 bushels. So right there it gives me, shows me that there's $10,000 worth of income that was earned during that year that I need to account for. So we'll do the exact same thing as we kind of um, move the cursor down and we also have on our non-current, so we have um, some additional cows here. So I've got five more cows that's worth another um, $3,000 to me at the beginning, at the end of the year actually about five or um, eight thousand dollars there. So when you take a look at what are those ending values versus the beginning, so again the, the point here is that we need to know what the ending minus the beginning is. So this farm didn't have a lot of liabilities but they did have some liabilities in here so we're going to take out those uh, liabilities and so he actually gained about close to fifteen thousand dollars or fourteen thousand dollars worth of equity during the year because of some debt that got paid off here so we have their owner's equity. So again balance sheet pretty simple beginning to the end of the year. Uh, most lenders do it and when I try to or force their producers to actually do this but when I get out on the farm a lot of times it's a March 1st uh, balance sheet and then they did their taxes January 1st to December 31st. So what's the problem with that? within two months and sometimes even within two weeks I could sell a lot of cattle, I could feed out two more weeks worth of feed and you can see that there's a lot of things that could actually change that inventory adjustment if this isn't catered exactly January 1st. Okay, so that's, uh, we're just going to leave it at that. It's a pretty important thing to um, make sure that the um, Schedule F and the balance sheets are the same tax year type deal. Okay, so after we get done with the balance sheet, then we're going to come on to income. So how do you collect the income? Every farmer has to collect the Schedule F. So that's how I tend to do this with the, um, with the grazers that I work with. I will break down line two based on the 100 weights of milk that they sold here in cell J56. And that will calculate to the dollars or the, 100 or the dollar value of milk that I'll pull off the milk check. How many calves did they sell during the year? What was the uh, uh, cull cows? They should not be reporting these cull cows on Schedule F. That's going to come from Form 4797. But every year I get onto farms that still report cull cows breeding stock on Schedule F. The problem with that is that they're uh, paying self-employment taxes on that Schedule F, and they should not be because that's actually a capital gain or a loss as they take a look at that. So anything else that they get in the uh, in the way of crops, um, some other heifer sales, or bull sales or something like that might come into these egg program payments. So it's a very simple income statement to actually do. So I really encourage producers to do this on an annual basis and do it as a whole farm analysis. So now we take the expenses. The expenses are going to come right off Schedule F, except I'll um, have to kind of self-calculate the fair market value of depreciation. A lot of times on their Schedule F, their cost or tax depreciation is exploded because of Section 179 or other things that they're uh, taking some accelerated depreciation on. So this is a number that actually gets calculated in the program because I want to do this on a market basis, not a tax cost basis. Um, I think it's a lot more realistic. So it'll break down feed purchases, but everything else sits here right as the Schedule F. So by the time you're said and done, that Schedule F, that 60,000 should be the exact number that shows on that person's Schedule F. So even though I'm adding in this fair market value for depreciation, it's actually calculating on the bottom line the, uh, the tax depreciation. And even though I am asking for the cull cows here, it's actually not going to show up in the income here. So this should correlate exactly to their uh, Schedule F as well. So what did we do so far? We did the balance sheet ending minus beginning. We did the Schedule F with the uh, taxes. We're basically about 90% done for the information. You need to do a financial analysis to try to take a look at these uh, grazing uh, economics. So then we have cash flow. So the question from how does a banker look at it? This is what a banker looks like. 
what was your beginning cash balance? I don't care where it came from. Can we use it to pay some debt? Non-farm income, so I don't care if your, prof, your farm is that profitable. If you have a spouse that's working off the farm and she's earning enough money to pay all your debt, then let's work with that. Okay, so income taxes paid. Principal payments is one that I always like to make mention, as I mentioned before as well, is that people think of this as an expense. Your principal payment in no way, shape, or form is an expense of your business. It's an investment that you make in your business, and yeah, maybe it's your banker that forces you to make it into your business, but in no way, shape, or form will the principal payments ever show up as an expense because it doesn't show up on the income statement. Okay, the only place you're going to see it is in this cash flow because it's a, it's a principal payment that has to get paid, but again, it's not an expense of the business. So family living expenses goes into that cash flow. So again, the banker is going to be taking a look um, at what that is. So capital purchases minus sales. So now I have this inventory at my machinery value at the end of the year was another, say, thirty or $40,000 higher in value, but during that year, I bought a tractor, I bought a TMR mixer or something in the tune of $51,200 that actually increased my ending um, asset values for machinery. So I can't take that as credit for income, so I need to come back and actually adjust that back out. So I need to know the capital purchases that were made during the year that helped inflate that ending net worth statement on the machinery. That money could have come from borrowed money, it could have came from uh, earned income as well, but we need to know what that is in the same way you might have sold some land or something like that so it comes into your cash income, but it's not truly um, it's something so we need to make sure that gets balanced out of your um, um, the balance sheet as well. So other production numbers, I like to do the cows and the herd because I like to benchmark things over the number of cows. I like to know the productive crop acres because I like to benchmark things off the productive crop acres. Um, we had this example at the beginning of the opportunity costs or what labor, the labor was not included in that initial study from the Center for Dairy Profitability that was not paid. Okay, so whether you get paid or not, we need to account for this labor because if you're just working out there for free, then I guess you probably don't have to have a use for a financial analysis, but you've got to cost your labor whether you're paying yourself or not. And your equity also has a cost for labor. So in uh, 2014, we tend to use about a 4% um, equity charge across all the assets. So whether the bank owns them, you're going to be paying an interest rate and that's going to show up in your income or your expenses. If you own them, there's an opportunity cost that you could actually invest that money someplace else and actually have a return. So you truly have a cost of doing business. So whether you own it or the bank owns it, there is a charge against that equity uh, to make sure that it's your, especially if you're ever going to try to compare your farm to somebody else's farm, we need to be able to account for that. So then how many unpaid labor hours did you put into your operation? And then is the 3,000, which is 60 hours a week, 50 weeks out of a year and full-time labor equivalents as well. Um, so here we got 3, 000, or three full-time equivalents, which a full-time equivalent is about 3,000 hours. So that's 9,000 hours worth of labor that goes into this operation. 6,000 of it's paid, but 3,000 of it is not. And so if we want to do a full financial analysis, those are the things that we really need to um, take a look at. So that's all the input. So we did the balance sheet. We did the um, income statement for the most part coming right off the schedule F. We did these cash flow numbers and we did some of this other production information number and the labor information and that's all I need to really do a full-fledged uh, financial analysis. Okay, so before I go to actually show what the output is, are there any questions on the input side of things of how this is actually being done? Okay, so hearing none, let's go to the output. Okay, so when we take a look at the thought process of what does this output look like? So first of all, on the last side, okay, I'm going to do this on a market analysis. I could also do it on a cost tax base if I wanted to, but I choose not to for the most part. Um, and so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to summarize the net worth summary here. And so you can see that this actually this farm actually had an equity change in cell B24 of 197,747, close to $200,000 worth of an equity change. Where did it come from? Did it come from cattle, increase in cattle? 
We know over 50,000 of it came because they actually purchased some machinery. So um, we know that, that there's a part that actually came from someplace, um, some monies that came from someplace else. We'll also summarize the cash flow statement. So again, this is what the banker is going to be looking for. If I can have an operation has, that has an extra, an excess of 10% extra cash flow in it, okay, that would tell me that that's a pretty opera, a good operation that I can um, can weather the storms of increased or decreased prices of various things and still weather the storms that they should be able to cash flow at the end. So that's a, a good banker benchmark right there. So speaking of benchmarks, as I move the cursor down here, you'll see the word grazing here. So in this program, we can actually benchmark on high production, conventional herds, average production, conventional herds, grazing herds, and organic herds. So I can uh, hit on either one of those, and it's going to change my benchmarks. But I'm going to stay with the grazing benchmarks. And so on a per cow basis, I'm going to benchmark this operation compared to what other grazing operations might be. So I'm going to take the information that I got from Schedule F. I'm going to take their dollar value numbers in total, which is this number here, or this column here, excuse me. And then we're also going to do it on a per hundred weight equivalent. And so just real quickly, the hundred weight equivalent is not the same as a hundred weight because we've got a few issues trying to calculate this thing in any kind of an operation, not just dairy. So these are the hundred weights of milk that were actually sold. This is the dollar value of the milk that was sold. And as we come down and divide that out, that means that their milk was worth $19.48. Okay, the reason I'm going to take a little time to explain this because this is probably one of the biggest errors that people make when they try to get 100 weighty uh, cost of production, whether you do that on your beef or um, you know, any other kind of enterprise or bushels of corn or whatever, this is, tends to be a problem. So now we have other things that get sold that are not milk. And how do you deal with it? So we're going we're gonna to take this number, 49,789. We're going to divide it by the 1948. And that's going to give me 100 weight equivalents. Again, not 100 weights, but 100 weight equivalents. Saying if this got sold out as milk, this is how, how many 100 weights it would have actually been. We'll do the same with cap sales and every other thing. So in this cell that you can't see that's blank is the sum of all these 100 weights here. So when I take my expenses, of this vet medicine, for example, of 7,752, I'm going to divide it by this number, which is the sum of all those 100 weight equivalents, to take a look at my 100 weight cost of production. And in doing so this way, um, you basically keep your 100 weight cost equivalent to the milk price you receive in the mailbox. Okay, so again, not just this enterprise, but it works the same for corn and beans on a per bushel basis as well. Okay, so as we take a look at the rest of it, then I'm just going to take this as a simple way. You can do this by hand if you want, but I like to benchmark everything per 100 weight equivalent. I like to benchmark everything on a per cow basis, and I like to put these cross comparisons in here um, of what this should be around here. So let's take the feed purchased right here. So this guy is probably buying about 65% of his feed. Okay, this is the total value of that purchase. On a per cow basis, based on about three and a half acres per cow, uh, I'm expecting that his purchase feed cost would be about 1986, and it's actually 1963. Okay, so it's a benchmark that he's just right on the money uh, for where we expect his, um, his feed cost to be. Okay, so Without spending too much time on any one of these benchmarks, I'm more interested in trying to go through the process here. So now we come down to our net cash income. So now I ask the question, like I did at the beginning of the session, what does that number mean? And I hope by at this point in time, your answer is it means absolutely nothing. Okay, we don't know if this guy even made any money or if he was profitable because we did not inventory adjust it. So now ending minus beginning inventory, let's go over to the left here. So we can see that this guy made about $30,000, just that he had $30,000 more of feed sitting on hand at the end of the year that he didn't have at the beginning of the year that didn't get fed out. Supplies and others, this could be some other types of feed, um, semen or anything like that. So his income change was a positive close to $36,000. He had a change in prepaid expenses from one year to the next, so he's, uh, he's you know prepaying expenses. So he purchased some things in 2000 say 14, that was really for 2015, so we adjust that back out of it. He had a gain of about $70,000 on machinery and equipment. 
again, we realized that 52,000 of that was purchased. Okay, and um, so when we take a look at that, we just got to make sure that everything gets adjusted out. So that was actually the machinery purchase. So his total inventory change was 65,000. So now his net farm income inventory adjusted was $247,000. Um, this is a husband and wife with about uh, two employees in the operation. Um, when you take a look at, can we start taking a look at, is, is he making money? At this stage of the game, I would tend to say, yeah, this guy's making some money. But again, we still don't exa know exactly how much because he could be a very high debted farm that's paying a lot of um, interest up here, but he's not, not a very high debted farm. So he's got a lot of equity that needs to get a return. So if I charge 4% across all the equity, I'm going to pretty much take about 63000 back out of it, which is pretty close to what his inventory change was. So his return to labor is 184000 So is that good? Most people tend to say that's pretty darn good. If that's over one person, that's extremely good. If that's over 10 people, maybe not so much. Okay, So that's why that unpaid labor is a very important factor to uh, take a look at. Okay, so that's the first page of the analysis. Uh, the second part, what I like to take a look at is, and I think this is probably the most important part, is we take a look at financial analysis. How efficient is this person doing things? So this is a re his return to labor. And now if I divide that by my 3,000 hours, this guy's making about 61.54 an hour. For every hour he puts in, he works with it. So this is a number that I really, really try to get producers to understand because we've got people out there that are making a negative 10 and a negative $15 an hour for every hour that they put into their farms and I've got other people out here sometimes that are making 50 and 60 and 70 dollars an hour okay so they know understand what labor efficiency is all about when we take a look at this um, so that's one thing so now we had our income on milk at 1948 our total expense is 1601. So what goes into this expense? This 63,000 of equity that we see here goes into it, and also the unpaid labor cost of 40,000 goes into it as well. So at 1601, if he would have only gotten 1601 for his milk, this tells me that he would have paid himself 63,133 for his equity, plus 40,000 dollars for his unpaid labor. Okay, and he would have broken even at that rate, okay, but yet he's got $3.46 still left over. That's pure profit to be either gone to his assets or what we did up here, we actually put that money as his return to labor. That's why that's so high because that $3.46 over top of that is also um, um, put onto his labor. Okay, so that's kind of a, a labor analysis, but we're not quite done with labor here yet either. Um, so in these cells here, uh, basically we're going to do a profit performance rating. So when we take a look at how does this guy um, or gal work, these are his numbers. This is what I put in as a goal and the font here must be a little bit too big as I expanded this. And this is an average and here is his rank between the goal and the average. So let's go down to this one. At 59 cows per FTE laborer, which is 3,000 hours, this guy has 60, 59 cows, which means he's 93% of the way between the average of 50 and the goal of 60. Okay, so that's kind of how that ranking all pans out. So a good benchmark for dairy operations that are not organic is that if I can get pulled out 1.1 to 1.2 million pounds of milk per full-time labor equivalent of 3,000 hours, that's a pretty good goal. So he surpasses this goal. Uh, pounds of milk sold per cow at, you know, I'd like to see him right around 19 in these grazing. These are hybrid grazing operations. Um, productive crop acres per cow plays big into feed costs. So if I'm a millionaire model dairy farm that's a grazing hybrid type operation um, and I'm buying a lot of my feeds, I'm pretty much going to be focusing on my pasture and producing some of my forage, especially corn silage, and I'm going to be buying my feed. So that's what he actually does with this. If I'm organic, I'm going to be doing the exact opposite. I'm going to be focused on my pasture and trying to uh, raise my grains and I'm probably going to try to buy my forages because the organic forage is a heck of a lot cheaper than the uh, organic grains. Okay, so I do that per labor unit in the top sections over here. So this is all dealing with labor. 
this is all doing with a per cow basis. This is my benchmarks on a per crop acre basis. On the bottom line, I just want to go through a couple more real quickly here yet, is return on assets. So if I'm going to bank on any one figure, I'm going to bank on return on assets because return on assets is a measure that actually marries your balance sheet with your income statement and your labor usage. Okay, so everything is married into this um, number. And so he's paying about 6.7% on his debt and he's making about 13% on his um, rate of return on assets. So we consider that a good, bank, a good bet. And the important thing here is that the um, I can take this one out to the market. So if I can buy CDs or I can buy some stocks or some bonds or something like that, getting five or six, seven, eight percent, and I'm making 13 percent in my business, then I think that's a very good place for me to invest my money. Return on equity, um, in the like ways, um, this is basically just a return on the portion that he owns at 13 percent. So yeah, we want to make sure that's higher than the rate of return on assets. The other thing I want to um, work with is operating profit margin. So when you look at a profit equation on any kind of a grazing operation, I think this is probably the biggest thing to put in producer's mind is that profit equals price minus cost in parentheses times volume. So the price minus cost squeeze, so how can we increase price profit? We can increase our price or reduce our cost. That's depicted by our operating profit margin. So here we've got 26% operating profit margin. So for every dollar that this producer brings into the coffers at home, he saves 26 cents on the dollar, which is actually pretty good. And I've actually got uh, dairy grazing producers, believe it or not, that I've got one that actually saves about 42 to 44 cents, very low input producer, of every dollar that he brings in, he pockets 42 to 44 percent. Okay, you compare that to the rest of other types of industries, they're lucky sometimes you get 10 and 12 cents on the dollar um, as profit. Okay, so I want you to remember that. That's a pretty important piece. Price minus cost is operating profit margin. The times volume part of the equation is depicted by our asset turnover ratio. So again, this is a very good operation here. In two years, he can gross enough income on his farm, believe it or not, to pay for all the assets on the farm, and he actually owns quite a bit of land. Okay, so that gives him a 50% um, asset turnover ratio. If this was three years, the asset turnover ratio would be 33%, which is kind of the, what the benchmark is pretty close to being. So we'd like to see him in these ranges. Okay, so again, profit equals in parentheses price minus cost times volume. So the profit is your rate of return on assets. Okay. Price minus cost is your operating profit margin at 26% times volume at 50%. So if I multiply these two together, the 26 times percent times 50%, it will equal 12.95%. So it's basically down this equation down here. Operating profit margin, those numbers just get filled in here in the program. Times their asset turnover ratio equals their rate of return on assets. So we're going to bank out that this operation is a very profitable operation to uh, to work with. Okay, so I know I kind of uh, did a whirlwind tour of a program here. It's called Dairy Trans, but we've also got Beef Trans and Crop Trans and Poultry Trans, Swine Trans, uh, Beef Trans, um, a lot of different types of sheep and goat trans as well. Um, different types of ways we can actually run a spreadsheet to actually do a full-fledged analysis to take a look at the uh, importance of um, or just the profitability of grazing. So any questions quickly on the program before I uh, finish up with this last spreadsheet that's actually going to cross compare some grazing operations and um, show you a data set. Uh, Larry, when you're talking about productive acres, do you include pasture in that definition? Good question. So um, usually what we'll do is I, I tend to say if it produces more than two, two and a half ton of dry matter, um, I, I will include it. And so it's kind of an estimated best guess as an educator that we're going to include it or not. Woodlands, I tend to just completely keep out of the system. And in fact, I, I keep the land asset values of that woodland out if they're not using it and it's not very productive. Um, sometimes I'll just double up the pasture acres, like say they're just getting about a ton and a half to maybe two ton compared to all the rest of their land. So I'll just count it in as half. So I'll just kind of try to vary that in a little bit. Any other questions? 
Okay, so what I'm going to do for the last uh, yeah, we few do minutes have, here we do is I'm just one going more, to Larry. real quickly compare. So, Natcha, let's do it. Okay, so um, re, uh, more of a comment. Return on assets gets harder as you own more more of the asset. And that is definitely true. So you want to make sure you're investing in productive assets. But let's take a look at land, for instance. Okay, so we know that land since the 1940s and 50s has increased about two to three percent above inflation. Okay. So it's got a it's an asset that yeah you you're paying interest on and let's just say that it's paying say you're paying 3 or 4% interest that we had in some of these past years and that asset was actually returning um, you know sometimes we've been 6 and 7%. Okay, so the more you have a land asset base if you're not accounting for that growth in that asset dollar value wise over time then that return on assets is going to be pretty small, okay, and sometimes it might actually go the other way. Okay, so if we look at the trend line right now, we're probably 25 to 30 percent above uh, the trend line for what land prices are right now, so um, will there be a correction? So it really depends on when you buy uh, the, the land asset. Okay, so if you're invested in a lot of machinery, for example, um, your tractors and some basic parts, pieces of machinery, tend not to depreciate very much, and especially used tractors are actually sometimes they're even appreciating at this point yet too. So when you take a look at TMR mixers, uh, slinger spreaders, um, hay vines, okay, things that depreciate quite well. If we're involved in a lot of depreciable assets, yeah, that return on assets might not be um, as good as you get more and more equipment or more and more land. So yeah, definitely a good point. Anything else? Okay, so real quickly, so the profitability of grazing. So I've got these millionaire model farms that I've been tracking since the early 1990s. Um, I use that dairy trans analysis that I just showed you uh, to actually put these data sets together. So I just um, take the information out of those spreadsheets, put them side by side. And so we're going to focus on these uh, five millionaire model farms. On the left side, I've got 10 organic farms that we did in 2013. These were five. Uh, millionaire model farm. So just real quickly, a millionaire model farm is a hybrid conventional grazing herd. It's basically these grazing operations that take the best of both worlds. Their cows are in free stalls. They try to do the, as best they can with cow comfort, um, feeding them the way they should. So the one that I showed you on the dairy trans, that was actually one of my millionaire model uh, farm producers that was making that $187,000. And that's after he already paid his wife uh, twelve or fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to do some other things. Um, so when you take a look at uh, that's kind of what I mean by a millionaire model farm. It's just a hybrid grazing farm that's taken the best of both worlds. So we can take a look at some of the data that they have here. So total assets on the farm, and these were a lot of farms that the goal here is that they become a millionaire after 25 years, starting with not much of anything, and most of these in the 15 to 17 years tend to get to that uh, million mark. So you can see what the assets on the farm here for the millionaire models versus the organic farms. The milk price difference between 30 and 20. Um, when you take a look at cash incomes, I'm not going to spend a lot of time just going through here, but you can kind of see what I did with the analysis of trying to cross compare uh, the thought process. And I guess I should think that if you want to put this up on the website to, to attach it with the webinar, I should have sent that file with you. Um, so here's your cash expenses, net cash income. So again, the question here, what does this net cash income mean? Again, the answer hopefully that everybody shouting out is it means absolutely nothing. Okay, now we inventory adjust this thing. We come down to our net farm income. Now we're getting somewhere. We take out the equity charge at uh, 4%. We actually did 3.5% in 2013. So now the average millionaire model farm, his return to labor uh, was 140000 these were some of the uh, inventory adjustments in the way of feed, livestock, and other things that came through with it. His unpaid labor costs, um, you can see what, what the unpaid labor costs, so most of these are just going down on one person. Uh, the rest is all paid for the labor. Um, these are the labor hours, um, and basically here's what we're trying to compare. So our organic farms on average, we're getting about $25 a, an hour for these 10 organic farms that we analyzed. The millionaire model farms are getting about 45,000. So question here is, is grazing that more, much more profitable than just pure organic? And I pulled out 
my two highest profit organic farms out of that, and he, they competed very well with the uh, the millionaire model farm um, data. So gross expense at 17.43 versus 23, and here I guess I would say um, organic actually threw another three dollars a hundred weight on top of the milk price for the current year. So um, and uh, the conventional milk price went down. Um, so basically, there's going to be some difference. I would if I was going to bet. Uh, who's going to be more profitable here this next year? I would definitely bet on the organic herds being as or more profitable than the uh, conventional herds. Number of cows per FTE. So all these labor efficiencies are going to be broken down on a per cow efficiency, per crop acre efficiency, so we can kind of cross compare those operations. Rate of return on assets, again, which marries the balance sheet, it marries the net farm income statement, it marries the, the labor usage all together in one uh, number. So it's a whole farm thing. So here, the organic farms at 8.28 percent, the um, millionaire model farms at 8.87, these two organic farms at 16, but I also say I've got a couple of these uh, millionaire model farms that would be uh, working with that, so management of these operations comes through. So if we take a look at, again, profit, rate of return on assets equals price minus cost in parentheses, which equals about 25 percent or 25 cents on the dollar, times the asset turnover ratio, which means it's I'm gross enough income on this farm in about three years to pay for all the assets. So you multiply those two things together and you get your rate of return on assets. Okay, so with that, when we take a look at the whole thought process, um, we're just going to kind of leave it at there. Um, if anybody has any questions, but that's kind of the thought process. When you look at these, um, the financials for grazing is how do you take a look at it? Please do not just look at it as net farm income. Make sure it's at least inventory adjusted and then plus do how much labor is going into that because all these different types of farms have different ways that they're either paying labor or not paying labor. They have a lot of assets in the way of land and things like that that needs to be accounted for with an equity charge if we're not paying the interest. And those debt loads can actually play into the um, cost of production figure uh, quite a bit as well. So then after that step, then we've got at the income over feed cost, yeah, so we're just going to cross compare um, an operation to kind of see what the basics of it are because 60% of that operation's cost tend to be in the way of feed. Not a bad way to start taking a look at it, but I would really encourage people to go the full-fledged and do a financial analysis, which means you've got to take the picture of that farm beginning and ending of the year. You've got to be able to inventory adjust it, use your schedule F to get that farm income and a few of those cash flow and some production factors and you get yourself a full financial analysis. So again, whether that's dairy as I use the example here, but you can use that for any enterprise, it's the process that I want to try to get across. So with that, hey Larry, this is, this is Rod, I got a quick question for you. Is there any correlation between the size of the operations here um, and I guess the reason my question, I'm, A, I'm curious because there's some of those old-fashioned farms that were small but because they you know, had such low uh, investment, they were quite profitable. But it seems the trend is really going towards these mega dairies where they can just, you know, balance off these massive costs across a broader base. Um, it, what do you see? Okay, that's a great question because when you take a look at how do con big conventional dairies, the mega dairies, make their money, they make it on asset turnover ratio. Okay, they are producing a lot of volume and sometimes that volume might not have a very high operating profit margin, so they might only be making five, ten cents on the dollar, but they're producing so much of it, they get a lot of money out of the, at the end of the year. Okay, so in comparison, we've got some uh, farms that are smaller herds that are organic and grazing, and um, where do they make their money? They make it on the operating profit margin, that price minus cost squeeze, and so especially on the organic side, they don't have to produce near as much because I, when we took a look at that income over feed cost calculator, I mean, uh, instead of milking 80 cows versus 80 cows, to break even, the organic herd in that example, I think, could actually milk 47 cows compared to the conventional guy milking 80 cows to get the same um, income over feed costs at the end. Does that kind of answer it? Yeah, that was great. Uh, Larry, we have, Larry we have another question. Another question that came in. Oh, go ahead, Matt. Okay. Um, can you run this to look at uh, the all grass milk premium and compare to conventional uh, organic prices? Right. You can run the income over feed cost calculator uh, to do that. What I would encourage. Um, 
is actually, we're going to be coming out here. The Leopold Center has actually funded some of my time to actually put together organic dairy budgets. And there, when people talk about organic, you think of this, everybody's got this one picture in their mind. But we have about eight or nine different scenarios, and they're quite a bit different on each one of them, depending on cow size, are they grass milk, are they low grain, are they um, feeding corn silage, are they high production, you know, what are they all feeding with that? So there's eight or nine different budgets with that. And so the grass milk is actually one that um, initially just based on milk production, it's kind of hard to see if it really pans out very well for some producers. If you look at it on paper, I would tend to say for some it's not, they're probably more profitable. Um, going with the um, the non-grass milk, but when you take a look at doing a full-fledged financial analysis, who am I to argue when they come to the end of the year and they say, well, I still made you know sixty, eighty thousand dollars doing this? Um, so it's more of a philosophical uh, thing for them, or they just don't like uh, dealing with the grain issue. They really like to just deal with the grass. And so who am I to say that you know? Even though it's not as profitable, if it works for them, it works for them. So yeah, we have uh, we're going to have those budgets. They should be rolled out here by um, mid to late summer. Um, so they're in a draft stage already because um, the rations are pretty much built on them already. So we just need to kind of go through some of the benchmarking uh, with those. And so those will actually be available on the Iowa State Dairy Team website uh, sometime later the fall. There's actually uh, dairy budgets already on there about seven or eight. Uh, different types of dairy budgets, which include some grazing budgets on the website right now, which is, um, if you just Google Iowa State University Extension Dairy Team, uh, you'll get to that website. Anything else? All right, appreciate that. Thanks. All right, so um, moving right along, I think we will be going to Rod Ofti next. And uh, this is Jane Jewett. I'll introduce him. So Rod Ofti is a person who is well known in the grazing and grass-fed beef circles in the upper Midwest, and particularly Wisconsin. Uh, he's a frequent presenter at workshops and pasture walks. Um, so Rod is a fourth generation driftless area farmer who operates an organic grass-fed beef ranch near Coon Valley, Wisconsin. He holds a BS from the United States Military Academy at West Point and an MBA from Boston University. Uh, Mr. Ofti has over 25 years of experience in the food industry, including time working in, in Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. And he's president of North Group Consulting, general manager of the Wisconsin Grass-Fed Beef Cooperative, and a core member of the Wallace Center Pasture Project team. And uh, as part of that team, he's been instrumental in creating the Pasture Project's Grass-Fed Beef Decision Calculator, which I'll add a quick plug here that um, one of the future webinars in our series will be featuring that calculator along with other resources, and that's the October one. So without further ado, I uh, will turn this over to Rod. OK, thanks, Jane. Um, so everybody can hear me. We'll dive right in there. So we, we're uh, got about 30 minutes left. Um, quick background to the, this calculator. Um, we uh, was initially designed by Jim Munch, who's a, a grazer in southwestern Wisconsin, and he's a, a person that's fanatic with data. So he's tracked about 30 years worth of uh, specifics, financial specifics on his farm, which makes for a really fun discussion when he's analyzing different approaches to his grazing uh, grazing operation. Uh, Dr. Alan Williams and I then chimed in, and we added a number of uh, areas where we, we really were trying to address and make this tool simple, uh, yet easy to use, yet you know all-encompassing, which is a hard thing to do, really targeting landowners and producers uh, to make them aware that there were alternatives to row crop production. Uh, about three years ago, as many of you remember, corn pushing seven dollars, uh, a lot of pasture getting tilled up. Um, we thought it was really all financially driven, but when we started doing some outreach and talking to landowners and producers, we found that a, a lot of times the answer, if not the majority of the time, was, hey, we didn't know there was any alternatives. You know, Mr. Neighbor offered X hundred uh, per acre rent, 
I didn't know any alternatives. I don't necessarily like corn, want corn, but they really weren't aware of the alternatives. We built this tool uh, with that in mind trying to come up with a return per acre for the upper Midwest uh, to talk to both landowners, educators, and producers to show them not only you know is grass competitive in the meantime, it's far superior than the general conventional row crop production. So the, uh, the website where this can be found, it is a free resource, so please uh, mark this down and I'll gab a little bit while you all note that. Again, it's a free resource. It's an interactive resource. You can go in and plug and chug and put all your numbers in there, uh, either as an educator to use for as examples or as a producer. Um, again, it is a flexible, hands-on tool, uh, but it is intended to be simple. Next to Larry's spreadsheets, we probably look like a kindergartners, but uh, uh, it is intended to be simple to use. We do have some really complex spreadsheets, which are fun, but I, I really found in a lot of the interactions with farmers, if you get overly complex or use a lot of terminology they don't use, they shut down. And they're not going to say anything. They'll be kind, but your, your, your effectiveness will be greatly diminished. So in that, in that aspect, the more simple and easily uh, to use you can make it, uh, the more uh, productive you'll be. Also give a caveat, we, are, we try to be conservative intentionally. Um, if I see a lot of presentations and the numbers are just pie in the sky, I shut down as well. So what we try to do is say, hey, the market prices are X, but folks, if the no market prices, know, they know, hey, you know what, I could probably even get better than that. That keeps, gets people really engaged, so that was another uh, approach that we wanted to do on this one. Um, so the goal of the, the grazing calculator is to provide a tool for educators and both producers to understand the financial impact of real or potential changes to their operation. A lot of times you'll meet farmers, even very experienced farmers that are continuously trying things and they'll say, well, maybe I shouldn't have done that or I should have done it different. If you know the financials and you know maybe some really critical uh, change points in your operation and you plug those numbers in, you can calculate, okay, if I plant this seed, it's gonna cost me X and it gives me Y more production in my pasture, what is the financial outcome? And you can you can run that scenario with these spreadsheets without having to maybe necessarily take that risk or take that step. Um, as, J as Jane alluded to, I, I do a lot of talks on grazing, uh, a lot about around uh, sustainability and financials. And when people hear the word sustainability, a lot of them think you know hippies, tree huggers, and kumbaya. And and for me, sustainability is is you know having a self-sustaining operation that but it's also understanding your financials. And a lot of people say, well, financials has nothing to do with sustainability, and I'd, I'd beg to differ because if you don't understand your financials and you make some serious financial mistakes, your farm will not be sustainable. And that's uh, keeping uh, people on their farms is a key part of keeping agriculture moving forward. Um, here's my general contact information. Um, we are limited with time today. We can happily take any questions as we, as we go. Uh, please send them in, but also please feel free at any time to follow up with me uh, via phone and or email and I'm happy to uh, go through things in more detail with you one-on-one -on -one and or answer any specific questions if you did not want to ask at this time. Okay, with that we'll go straight to the models and I will take... Alright, so we're going to start with... Uh, some of these will go into more depth uh, and again, you can play with these as you like, and, and we'll glance over the cash flow. That's an interesting scenario, but, um, okay, Robert, I just got a request for you to have mouse control. Do you want that? Uh, no. Okay, I'm assuming that uh, you want me to keep doing this. Okay, um, so we'll charge on. So the first scenario here, again, there are a number of different operations, and, and maybe you'll use this as an educator to talk to someone who's thinking about a cow-calf operation um, and or people that already have one and just want to do it better. Um, so th this is a lot of ways to, to, to show different approaches to that kind of operation. So I'm going to quickly glance over our assumptions. And again, these aren't right or wrong. If you are a world-class calver and you always calve 99%, you can put that in there and it'll have a positive effect on the bottom line. But for in, in many scenarios here, rather than be overly complex, we just took industry averages, okay? So we're, we're assuming that you calve 90% of the cows that you breed. Uh, we, we built in a 20% replacement cost, which uh, comes down on our bottom line later on. Uh, in grass-fed operations, we're looking probably maximum of an average weight of 1,200 per cow, uh, sometimes slightly smaller. Uh, 
the grass-fed beef industry, it's, it's, it's growing in addition to the conventional prices are extremely high. Grass-fed in branded programs or direct marketing, you can traditionally get about 20 to 25 percent above conventional prices, which are already high. So this is a conservative number at 90 cents for cull cows. Um, you could probably get well more than that, but uh, we use that for planning purposes. And we're assuming that you're going to sell your, your calves at 550 pounds you know, to a finisher or some other program. And then that's with some two key numbers here that are, well, I'll spend quite a bit of time on. Uh, we need to calculate the cost of harvested forage and your cost of uh, uh, pasture. And if you go away with one thing today, the real reason why it's key to extend that grazing season on pasture is you'll see here the cost of pasture for harvested forage, uh, or cost of harvested forage versus pasture is really almost a three to one. Now, if you, I know people that buy all their feed, uh, well, then you could just put in the cost per ton that you paid right here. But this really shows the synergies and in, in where a, a person can make money in their operation, be it stock or finishing or cow calf. The longer you can extend that grazing season, that has a big impact on your financials. Um, we're assuming an upper Midwest scenario here where, like it or not, we uh, are probably on pasture only half the year. Again, if you've got a system built up, you're, you're maybe putting some winter storage, some sorghum sedan or something else that allows you an extra month, you can adjust that and has a positive effect on your bottom line if you can graze longer. Uh, we assume that um, an animal is going to take in 3% of its uh, its body weight in, in uh, dry matter, um, which gives us a total uh, total tons of pasture and harvest for, harvested forage consumed, uh, and then a cost of that uh, the cow calf uh, production. Now we built in some uh, purchase feed costs and some non feed costs. These are upper Midwestern averages that we've taken from uh, a number of sources, including Iowa State, uh, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Uh, again, if yours are much lower there, uh, great, good for you. Uh, you can put it in, but on average, people are feeding some supplements, uh, some salt, and things like that. So adding all that together, we have our total cost of the cow-calf. Um, we're building in some uh, efficiencies there and in selling the cull cows, so the, the total is so, somewhat lower. Gives us a, a cost per pound to produce that calf of $1.19, which is an interesting approach. And then this is also very helpful because we work our way back into the forge. We know that it takes 2.6 acres uh, to produce that you know, sustain the cow and to produce that 550-pound calf. So that helps as well if you're talking to an audience that want to get into grazing, they want some general, you know, calculations, what could I maybe run on, on this land with this kind of productivity, uh, you can work backwards uh, from there as well. So we're assuming the market price, uh, 263, again, that's a very, very fair, if not slightly conservative price right now for 550-pounders, would generate a total revenue of 1,447. Um, which gives you a margin after you subtract that from the cost of $793, uh, total margin or a return per acre. And again, this is a number that we were trying to find uh, to compare at least somewhat directionally apples to apples with crop rent of $309 per acre from a cow-calf operation. Now, it's really, really interesting that traditionally cow-calf was always second place to a finishing operation. It was just kind of the way it, the way it was. In fact, I remember when we first built this, um, the cow calf returned about uh, a little bit less than a half of what a finishing operation did. So, uh, as you'll see when we get to the finishing operation, because of high calf prices now linked to a you know a, a small beef herd and a growing market, um, that scenario has changed. I'm going to move on to stockers quick. This is just assuming that you're going to buy calves in more of a stocker weight, around 400 uh, uh, pounds. And then uh, current market price for those those animals, giving you a total cost of that calf right now at 1264. Um, if you're going to bring it up to a, a weight of 750 pounds, your average uh, weight from finishing there is 575. Assuming we, we can add, add uh, 2.1 pounds per day, um, which again should be quite conservative if you've got a good uh, good grass-based program. Uh, I've met a number of guys that swear they're putting on three pounds a day, but you know 2.5 is not uh, super hard to do. Uh, that will make your numbers look better. Uh, take, taking that from wean to finish in 167 days, uh, around 3% of the, the dry matter intake again, and this is your total tons of dry matter would take to finish that, get that animal to the weight uh, of 750 pounds. Again, we've got both of the, both of our numbers here, the cost of uh, uh, harvested forage as well as your cost of your pasture. Um, working our way down to... Um, Purchased and non-feed costs there, again, adding in for those things. 
um, minus your cost gives your total cost for that calf with everything included of $1,680. And assuming that you're you're selling that um, animal at 205 per pound, your total revenue is uh, 1538 not necessarily an attractive operation at this time. Now there are a number of things there that you can you can tweak up and down, uh, but obviously not as promising as, as, as it had at one time, which in itself in the industry is causing some bottlenecks. Let's jump on to, uh, uh, to finishing. So here we were, we're assuming that we're going to buy in some animals at 700 weight uh, at a price of 233. Total cost of that animal will be 1631. We want to get it to that 1200 uh, finish. Um, so the average weight from weaning to finish will be a 950. Here, um, probably a bit more higher quality forage if you're going to try to have finished something. So we've got a little higher daily gain. Uh, the days from weaning to finish, um, uh, 208. Again, 3% uh, dry matter, giving us a total of 3.2 tons of feed to get that animal to 1200 pounds. Uh, so again, our cost of dry matter, uh, harvested dry matter, as well as pasture, um, all the other um, purchase feed and non-feed costs added in to get us a total cost of 2,048 for that uh, for that feeder to finish it. Now the price per pound of $3.15, some of you might say hi, that is a hanging weight price and that is also reflective of branded programs in the upper Midwest, um, branded programs being Thousand Hills, uh, grass-fed beef cooperative, things like that. Um, that is traditionally about 20 to 25 percent higher than conventional pricing. We're assuming we can get a, a 58 percent uh, dressing weight, which would generate a total revenue of 21.92, or 144.64 dollars 64 Now the return per acre there is 119.33. Now, as I mentioned before, cow calf um, three years ago was 119, or it was about 120 dollars, and fit in finishing itself was around 300. So they've They've kind of changed places, which is quite quite interesting to see. All right, I'm going to talk briefly about. Uh, we've also tried to add a caveat, and we, we ended up starting with just cow calf and the finishing scenarios. We added the stocker because we did talk with some producers that you know were pursuing that situation, and then we also a lot of the talks we give, we have a lot of folks that are really heavily interested in uh, direct marketing. So for the direct marketing scenario to, to adjust for those additional revenues, but also the additional costs, we took the feeder to finish scenario. So we're buying a calf at 550. Everything else on down here is all the same. However, when we got to the bottom, um, we've got a similar uh, return per acre of $155, but then we went and added the post harvest costs. So in this scenario, we've accounted for uh, transport to the plant. Uh, you've got a cost per head. You got a usually a $65 per head kill fee. Um, 60, 60 cents per pound is a pretty good average, which you're paying a processor uh, to to process that animal. Um, sometimes you can get cut, cut wrap and freeze for 50, 55 cents. Uh, there's some places that do really nice cryovac for you know they charge in the 70 to 80 cent range. So um, you have to account for whatever your program is pursuing there, giving our, us a total processing charge of $501.60 per head. Uh, I had to build in some for storage for the retail ready beef transport. Um, you've got to account for your marketing sales, label costs. We've got some miscellaneous in there as well. Um, and to get you a total post harvest cost of 585.52 uh, for that animal, um, including your uh, your pre harvest cost gives you a total of 1935. Now, if your cost at uh, with the wean calf opportunity cost included is 25 uh, 2054 and then we've got these two scenarios here in terms of your uh, um, you know what you can yield so this this uh, target sales price retail yield number takes the uh, finished weight um, so this is kind of table ready weight if you will uh, which is calculated as 70% of your hanging weight and we're assuming you're charging six dollars per pound um, Again, which is probably a very average, if not a light price. If you're selling certified grass-fed beef, you could probably get closer to six and a half to seven dollars a pound. But again, that's that's a scenario with those assumptions, which would yield you 29, uh, 29.2320, or a net profit of four hundred dollars. Uh, if you did just sell by the hanging weight, and we're assuming um, you sold an offer to a customer to pay it uh, four dollars hanging weight. 
um, and then you know they can do the processing, and then you you take the four dollars times the six ninety six, um, which gives you a, a twenty seven eighty four um, yield, and then your net profit being two hundred sixty three forty six. So, uh, you know, an interesting way to maybe generate a bit more money. Uh, I think direct marketing is very romantic, and there's a lot of people that are drawn into it, but from personal experience, I'll let you know as well. It's it's an immense amount of work, and this uh, these costs up here probably don't don't do the true cost justice in terms of time and and energy spent. So, any questions on those first uh, three four models there? Uh, Rod, this is Jane. I have a question about the the direct marketing piece yeah. where you were um, showing the price per pound, and if you're if you're charging the hanging carcass weight price of four dollars a pound and having the customer pick up some of the processing costs, um, so then should that not be accounted for with a lower post harvest cost to the producer? I have to double check that. Um, this number actually looks low. I'm, I'm wondering if we didn't already. Um, I think we may have actually have already put the cost in there, Jane. Okay, that number you've got bracketed right now is the is the um, sales price, right? Yeah. And yeah. then uh, to take our net profit here is 46. So our total cost. Yeah, so we've got the post harvest. Post harvest costs are included. So processing's there. This is a post harvest cost already included. So we did take that one out. See, th this is uh, this number here is minus E46, which is the total cost. And this total cost is a is a combination of the pre and post harvest costs, which includes processing right there. Yeah, right. But I'm saying if you're if you're selling direct like quarters and halves with a target sales price of four dollars a pound of the hot carcass weight, then are you not putting some of those post harvest costs onto the um, onto the buyer to pay directly so that the producer uh, can make Yeah, I guess pay. that's that's your that's your marketing choice. Uh, so for example we sell for four forty nine and now I pay processing, but I think this is low. But back to my comment before, I also know people that they sell at three ninety nine and they pay the, the, the harvesting. So uh, you know, maybe being conservative, I didn't want to put a pie in the sky, really high number. People say, "Oh, that's too expensive. I could never charge that." You're absolutely right, and I would suggest I would suggest that this number be higher. Okay, thanks. Yep. Yeah. So if you, you you put in a good example. So we charge 4.49. Um, you know, so again, I'm passing on more of that because of a higher purchase price. That that makes your net profit go up almost by 50%. If you, know, if you take it back down to the four that we had in there before, it's yeah, almost double. But again, you can you know when you're talking to either your audiences and or it's a different market or more expensive, you can be more aggressive. I just didn't want to have this you know 4.99 and somebody say, well, I could never sell it for that. So so this number is uh, you know is unrealistic. Any other questions? Okay. If you do, please feel free to cut in. I'm going to touch on the, the cash flow um, scenarios. Uh, this was done by by Alan Williams, and also very interesting uh, format. Not going to spend a ton of time on it because this is much more designed for you know significant large programs. So we're talking about programs with 200 cows, um, you know, generating a large number of calves every year, retaining some. Uh, for for breeding as replacements, um, having a 10% call rate, but this takes in your your annual costs, uh, your sales, and uh, as well as your post harvest costs. But in in general, we've also tried to allocate here for for interest because in larger programs, the chance of people probably having to take out a loan are probably a lot more realistic. Um, but here you should see shows in, in general you generating from this 200 cow calf operation 143,000 in net profit. And I guess the highlights of this, uh, of these sheets here, if you go to the different tabs, what you see over time, uh, gaining synergies and productivities, you go from, um, you know, 11% return uh, without interest in terms of return on investment to 12, 
to year 13 flattened into 12, but year 4 goes to 20, uh, and year 5 staying at 20 there. So that's quite an impressive, uh, quite an impressive uh, cash flow return uh, for an operation of that size. Should you have somebody that wants to consider it, um, move on to value calculator. This is a really simple but also a, an easy to use tool uh, for a number of scenarios. So I like this one if if you kind of want to understand with markets moving all the time, both from sales price, acquisition price, resale price. Um, if I want to understand, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at buying some you know some animals. Um, what's the market going out right now? What's the market coming in? Where's my risk? Uh, and then also, what is my gain per day? Um, just from a risk analysis, this is a healthy exercise. And also for folks that uh, we've got a number of people that think of putting animals on their pasture just over the summer, and they kind of want to know either what am I going to gain from this pasture, or if I'm going to rent pasture, uh, what can I offer without going backwards? So this helps you as well, because if you know the value uh, of gain per day, you can you know maybe assess okay what of that gain can I share in terms of uh, pasture rent? So in that scenario, we're looking at just buying a 350 pound weaned animal uh, at 280, and again, all these are interactive. So if you can get them cheaper, you know what? Uh, well, let's put in 265. Your 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 value gain per day goes from 140 something to 198. So buying right uh, is is always key. However, I probably see mistakes made there more often, and that people think uh, or they make purchase decisions based on a good deal. Um, you know. Think of the genetics, and when all of a sudden you can't finish the animal, the frame's not appropriate for grass. That good deal becomes a sinkhole. Uh, so, uh, you know, keep good deals in mind and make sure you've got the genetics to finish properly on grass. If you want to change your average daily gain, again, we talked about two pounds uh, not being uh, super difficult to achieve. But if you just got marginal pasture, maybe you know, plan worst case scenario, put 1.5 in there. But let's say we can get that gain up to two. Your your average value gain per day goes from 145 to 258. Okay, it, your days on that gain are 100 and 100 times whatever value you've got in the average daily gain, giving your your value for uh, per pound when you sell it to generate your uh, total income per head of 1237.50, uh, which is a margin of 257.50 or a, a gain per day of 258. So we've done this both for steers. And for heifers, um, traditionally on the market, heifers are get beat up a little bit because of yield. Um, that is changing slightly. We're seeing some uh, heifer retention uh, in the market, which is driving up heifer prices as well. So they're almost on par to some extent in some markets with with steers. So, all right. Well, that was try to kind of a whirlwind uh, tour of our uh, grazing financial calculators. Are there any other questions the folks have for me or? Would you like to go back to one of these or talk about different scenarios or I'll open them back up to the audience. Okay. Um, we had a question come in from Alice and Van of the Pasture Project and uh, Matt, do you want to give Allison the voice control so she can ask her questions. She's got a couple of them. Go ahead, Allison. Okay, um, it's it's not coming through, so I'll just read your question. One of them is, what are some of the trade-offs with a simpler tool like this, uh, the Pasture Project Grazing Calculator? Where is it useful, and where is it important to have a more detailed tool like what Larry presented? Yeah. Well, I think uh, I I tried to touch on it earlier. The 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 key for me in producing this, even in the field, I, I can. Put this on a large billboard, or, you know, just a, a two by four uh, uh, piece of uh, board, and you, know, you can present it, and people can easily digest it. So I'd rather 
you know, get 80% or 90% of the crowd to come with me, and that's the advantage of a simple model because everybody gets it. A lot of them probably know their own numbers here, and if not, it's probably easy to calculate. So that, that's really our approach when we do outreach. Make sure you get 80 to 90% of the crowd to go with you. For those 5 to 10% that want to go deeper, we can much more easily take them into some of these more in-depth cash flow numbers. Uh, spreadsheets and uh, you know and work with them specifically but the number of 200 cow operations that we work with is in the small single digits versus um, you know the number of folks that have 10 20 50 cows what was the second okay. part of that question yep the other question was for both the presenters uh, for the finance phobic how do you engage grazers in thinking about their finances and I think this yep. is also a question where um, other people on the webinar might have some answers too and if you do please feel free to chat those in as comments and we'll uh, collect those. I, I always start with the sustainability piece which I talked to before because that really gets people's attention. I think we all strive for that but when I do a hard link between understanding your financials and um, being sustainable and staying on your farm they get it. And it, it kind of shakes them to, to pay attention because you may not like it, but you know if you understand that it's you try again you try to keep it simple so you don't lose people, but you understand you're trying to help them, and the more they understand their costs and their situation, the better off uh, they will be. Now, well, there are people that do cow calf when it wasn't productive. My gr funnest example is Jim Jim Munch himself when we did all these numbers. And he, he was proven to me and showed that you know a finishing operation delivers three times the profit of a cow-calf operation. I said, Jim, you know all this stuff, and you're, you're presenting this stuff, and yet you're a cow-calf operator. And he said, because I love the miracle of birth, and he doesn't do it for the money. Now, maybe not all of us can do that, but there's a good example of he, but he knows where he's at, and it's fine, but he's not kidding himself. And he does what he does because that's what he wants to pursue, but he's still making sure he's making money at it. So I think that's... If you bring it in from that perspective, it makes it less uh, endangering, I guess. And I guess from my perspective, what I would say is how I try to get people interested when I kind of mentioned the um, the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire program, that whole thought process of being a millionaire, I think kind of gets people uh, interested of how can you really make that much money over time, uh, milk and cows in the dairy industry. Uh, the second twist I would probably tend to use is just um, the thought process that the more cows I have, the easier it is to run my farm if I'm a grazer and I look at my cows as being employees that are out there so I don't have to uh, cut the hay, I don't have to break it, I don't have to bale it, I don't have to chop it, I don't have to put it into storage, I don't have to get it out of storage to feed them and so just the whole thought process and then they come to the milking parlor and they give me the milk um, and then on the flip side they go back on the pasture and they deposit the manure so you think of all those um, very labor and machinery intensive uh, things that we do um, on dairy farms, especially in the confinement type setting, and again, I employ my cows to do that. Yeah, we got a uh, similar similar question on the same topic. Um, you know, where dairy producers would rather fail conventionally than to try grazing. How do we overcome resistance to that? Okay, probably the first thing I would say is that there's a lot of conventional producers that um, are very profitable. I mean, they've got they've got this asset turnover thing uh, uh, pretty well figured out with some very good cow comfort. And freestall barns uh, tend to pay for themselves over time to take a look at it. So I don't want to say that conventional is not profitable. It, it's actually very profitable as well, even with the uh, current prices that we have. Uh, when you take a look at the thought process of the um, with the grazers and the um, and, so, and even the organics can I further that profitability uh, working with it? Some people can and some people can. So it's kind of more of a, a mindset and what type of an operation you like to uh, to manage. Um, and so more of the issues I think are just you know, what kind of a producer like um, you mentioned a little bit about um, you know Jim likes the cow's cabin and things like that. There's just some dairy producers that like working with machinery and they like the confinement free stalls and there's others that don't. So how do you try to work with all of them, I guess? Any other questions?
Uh, Larry, can you describe a hybrid grazing farm for us? Okay, so a hybrid grazing farm, which those millionaire models all tend to be, and so part of that model is that they, um, they practice rotational grazing. They tend to have crossbred dairy cattle. They tend to be labor efficient with one of the low-cost milking parlors in there. Um, and so they also tend to have manure storage. They tend to have freestall barns. Okay, so when you look at these farms, you're going to look at them except for the pastures. You're going to say, well, these guys are doing um, everything conventionally. It's just the summer months for six, eight months, these cattle are out on pasture as well. And sometimes they get, um, you know, 20% of their forage, some are up to 30, 40% of their forage comes off the pasture. So that's kind of the hybrid. They're still being fed corn silage, um, anywhere from 12 to 20 pounds of grain or uh, commodities going into these um, operations. So that's kind of what we would define as the, um, that's kind of the hybrid. They're just, they're taking the best of both worlds. It's not a, just a low-cost grazing operation. But I think probably the important thing is like for beginning producers, uh, we definitely use in the Wisconsin, I think they still have at least one-fourth or about a third of the producers that get into the business uh, grazing. And I see the same thing here is that uh, grazing definitely allows the way uh, people get in. But so in some of these years, in 2004 and 2007, when we saw some pretty high milk prices and some pretty low feed prices, and I've had some of these millionaire model producers, I remember one couple that uh, was sitting down there, you know, $300,000 worth of income that year. So what do you do? Do you give it to Uncle Sam or do you build that freestall barn or do you build that manure storage? And so we think it's a very timely uh, building of it is that people tend to make their life easier over time with machinery and things like that, um, but they kind of pick and choose what years those things go in. And so in those high income years are when those investments in some of those things um, work with. But as a beginner, uh, the, that model was actually set up with 80 cows on 80 acres and only about $40,000 worth of machinery. That would cover a cheap, cheap tractor and uh, probably a pretty cheap skid steer, a four-wheeler, uh, maybe a, a little bit of a hay bind and a spreader, and that was all the machinery that these beginning farmers would actually start with. But again, those businesses grew over time, and so when they had the opportunity to purchase because of some tax liability anyway, that's when they would buy more machinery or improve the machinery and kind of build themselves up on that uh, model to, to get bigger. Hey, Larry, I've got, this is Rod again. i got another question for you. I guess put your uh, crystal ball on the table. Uh, it seems that grass-based milk is kind of where grass-fed beef was maybe five or ten years ago, but growing rapidly. Do you see um, maybe grass, the grass-fed dairy movement not eclipsing but at least closing in on organic because it's a very environmentally friendly, easily supported uh, industry, but it's also still less expensive than pure organic. What were your thoughts there? Yeah, I guess if I would have the crystal ball, I would tend to say there's probably going to be a move made at some point in time uh, towards that direction. How soon it's going to happen, I don't know, but I think people are getting a pretty good feel right now for what grass-fed milk is going to do with the marketplace. Um, okay. So is it more important than the organic? I'm not so sure, um, but there's a tendency that it's, it's it's coming off the shelf. So somebody's buying it for a pretty good size price as well. Somebody had mentioned earlier about like economies of scale of the mega dairies, and one other comment I guess I wanted to make back then that I forgot to was the, just the thought process. You know, where do we see these economies? You know, people can say that um, economies are uh, you know these 300 cow dairies, 600 cow dairies. But I tend to find, and I think there was actually a research project that just showed by the time you started looking at 80 to 120 cows, you pretty much have a good base unit for um, that can be run pretty labor efficiency, efficiently that can actually cross compare to a lot of, uh, of uh, bigger type dairies. And so I think that economy of scale in the dairy industry is a lot lower than what people are. And I think it is. And if I take a look at my experience uh, working with beginning farmers, getting started, if I can get guys with um, milking 80 cows on 80 acres of rented or pasture land and moving in with husband and wife type deal with a person and a half at 120 cows, and even under that 160 cows, I think that's a, there's a pretty good economy of scale in that 160 um, cow range. And so that whole balance between 120 to 160 with a husband and wife, maybe a little bit of employees uh, brought into it, I think can be some pretty viable operations for us. Well, everybody, that puts us at time. It's just after 10.30.
So uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, we're going to be, as we said before, sending out a survey uh, and uh, there'll also be an, an email that's going to be sent out that has the website, the resources, and then a link to the recording. Uh, so please do fill out that survey uh, and and thank thank you thank you very much. Uh, mark us in your calendars for the next webinar, which will be on uh, July 10th, uh, and the subject will be uh, adaptive high stock density grazing. Uh, once again, thank thank you all very much for coming, and have a good day.